And we thank you, Father, that you meet our other needs as well. And, and Father, not always in the ways that we might think is best, Father, because you do know best, Lord. But we thank you that you are wise and powerful and loving and caring and kind. And we pray, Father, that you would speak to us through your word and that we would grow and that we'd be strengthened this evening, Father, that we would just lay hold of your truth, Father, and allow it to transform us. And we pray, Father, for those who are sick and hurting among us, Lord, and and all the body of Christ, not just here at Blessed Hope, Father, but we know there's people really hurting really bad in different parts of the world. And we do thank you, Father, for uh, Rosemary and Tasia and it looking as though they've got all the cancer. We pray that she is cancer-free, Lord. If she's not, and there's something remaining. We pray that uh, you would uh, take care of her, Lord, and, and, and heal her. And we pray that you'd be with her. We thank you again for uh, Bernie, Father. And we just pray that you'd be with her and strengthen her, Lord. And and anybody else, Father, we pray for Zach, that you'd be with him as he cruises around the world on a ship, Lord, solo. And we just pray that uh, you'd keep him safe, Lord, and comfort him and speak to him, help him grow, Lord. And we pray, Father, as we are all on our journey, Lord, that we would glorify you and be the people that you've called us to be. And, Father, there's a lot going on in our nation right now, and there's so much at stake, Lord, regarding the family, Father, regarding the future of the country we live in, Lord, and the direction it's going. I know your heart's broken, Lord, and and we just pray for the leaders in this nation, Father, whether they're federal leaders, Father, or state leaders, or county, or city leaders, Lord, we pray that you would speak to their hearts. And I know there's an onslaught, Lord, of filth that they're being programmed by, and lobbyists, and greed, and all those things are factors, Lord, and we just pray that you'd break through to as many as possible, that you'd raise up voices to speak prophetically, to speak the truth, Father, to the people in our nation and leaders in this nation, Lord. And we pray, Father, that we would not be on the sidelines as people are being led to destruction, Lord, whether it's babies in this Holocaust that we're facing or whether it's souls for eternity, Lord, but that we would rise up and speak the truth in love, Lord, and that we'd show people the love of Christ and we'd show them your word. Father, we thank you. Uh, Keep us, we pray. Protect us and use us to your glory. And may your Holy Spirit, Father, by your power, speak to us through your word. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Praise God. Hey, this is a time of uh, worship and, you know, praise and worship, a time of prayer. You know, we pray several times and Thursday night it's like, well, it would be great if we had a a time to get in the word or it would be time to get in worship or we got to have time to pray and and the neat thing is on a Thursday night, uh, well, by the time the service is over, you'll have prayed at least four or five times, three or four. Hopefully, you're praying off and on, you know, through the service as well. And when you're worshiping, hopefully you're talking to the Lord. Praise and worship, praise, is that word is connected to prayer. So when we have, you know, 25 minutes of worship or so before the service starts, uh, that's the p- first part of the service, you know. And a lot of times it's like, oh, well, you know, I'll get there for the word or something like that. But when you're praising, that's a form of praying. So you are in a prayer meeting when you're praising because it's a singing. You're singing your prayers. You're talking to the Lord. You're waiting on him. You're crying out to him. So it's awesome. And then we get in verbal prayers as, as well. And I want you to encourage, you know, be encouraged to when you, when you praise the Lord and, and you're worshiping and you're singing to him, to keep in mind that, I'll, I'll tell you right, right now, if you just kind of sing words but your mind is everywhere else, you know, and and you're not really engaging the Lord, and you know, your worship time in the Lord is not going to be very productive. But if you're thinking about what you're singing, and maybe it's a song you feel like, oh, I've sung this song like 50,000 times, and, and it doesn't move me anywhere. anywhere. Well, I, sometimes I'll change the words when I'm singing, if that happens. Or maybe it's just a song that moves everybody else, but it just doesn't move you, the melody or whatever. Well, you know what? You can engage the Lord with that song or your own song during that time, you know, and begin just... Uh, talking to the Lord and, and redeeming that time and just using that melody or whatever to just praise Him. And it's just, these are ways that you become more effective in your prayer life and, and, that, and that you redeem your time. You know what I'm saying? So, and praise the Lord. We have a great worship team and we're able to, you know, they, they'll sing any from, they'll do anything from hymns to, you know, choruses to, you know, you name it. We've got such a, a great variety of songs. I mean, they just pulled an oldie but goodie out, you know, with uh, Hiding Place, which is one of my favorites. And 
And I just uh, praise God for that. And that's right out of the scriptures, by the way. I know, you know some people like the hymns, some like the choruses. I personally, I love the hymns because they're so rich in doctrine, many of them. Not all of them. Some of them are actually a little bit off. Uh, but I love the choruses when they're, when they're scriptural. I won't sing them if they're not scriptural. But a lot of the choruses are taken right out of the Psalms. Like the song Hiding Place. That's like lifted right out of the book of Psalms. You're supposed to sing Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. You can't get more scriptural than singing a chorus right out of the Bible. You see? So praise God for the variety of worship that we do have. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. And this verse, I was looking at taking more than one verse today, and I didn't want to go into verses 26 and following because that stands as its mess, a message on its own. And 24 and 25, I couldn't do it. I thought, you know what, we're not going to go into 24 and 25. We're just going to look at verse 24 today because it's such an important verse. And verse 25 is intricately related, but... It, I, you know, uh, in the pace that we've been taking Hebrews, we've taken big chunks and shorter chunks. And that verse, uh, I think, in the context of what I want to do, demands a full service as well. So I want to look, fo- I focus, you know, mostly on verse 24 this evening uh, in the time that we have. And, of course, we'll look at a lot of Scripture, verse 25 as well a little bit. But I want to really hone in on verse 24 and challenge you this evening to obey that verse and make sure that you're obeying. That's a, that's a command from the Lord. I mean, it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. And, you know, a lot of times people are, you know, ask me about the will of God for their lives. In fact, it's, it's interesting. This, you know, today I was talking to my daughter Holly, uh, maybe, you know, 20 minutes or a half hour or so about, she asked me, you know, she talked about God's will for her life and that she's been seeking it. And she's being used by the Lord and she loves to, you know, encourage people in the faith. She loves to witness the lost. She loves to worship the Lord and she lives for him. But she's thinking in terms of, you know, in the long haul, what she might specifically do uh, to glorify the Lord. She has different thoughts and so forth. And, you know, and I brought up Hebrews 12 to her about how the Bible says, you know, we're not to be conformed to the world, right? But uh, transformed by the renewing of our minds. And, you know, we're not supposed to, you know, we're supposed to lay up our bodies as living sacrifices, right? Holy and acceptable unto the Lord. And, and then it says, thereby, that's how we prove His perfect will in our lives. And as we submit to Him wholly, and I told her as you continue to submit to Him, His will will unfold for you as you give yourself to Him. And, and we had a, a good time talking about the Word together. And it's interesting because... Uh, as I was having that chat with her, and I've been working on a few different things, juggling different messages, uh, uh, and, but this verse, verse 24, has been one I've been meditating upon for years, <laughs> you know? Verse 24, in fact, it, it's, a, it's a big verse in my own ministry. It says, And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. You know, and this is not written to pastors, although it's written to pastors as well, but not exclusively. This is written to the body of Christ. It's written to Hebrew Christians who were, some of them were in danger of falling away, going back into legalism and the Mosaic law, others being hardened by sin, Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. They were in danger, and he's encouraging them to, to consider how they may stimulate one another to love and good deeds. And as a pastor... When I put messages together or when I'm getting ready to counsel somebody, it's important that I give thought to the text first and foremost, what we're going through, but prayerfully, Lord, help me. And it's often my prayer. Help me, Lord. I often pray that those words right there. Help me stimulate the congregation to love and to good deeds. And, uh, you know, and because of that being one of the, you know, one of the truths that undergirds the very essence of what this fellowship is called to, uh, therefore the fellowship should be a loving fellowship, you know? Uh, and it is. We have a very, very loving fellowship. I mean, I don't know of any, in, by God's grace, and not knock on wood, but plead with the Lord to have mercy on us, we haven't had any you know, schisms in our fellowship by the grace of God since we've been a fellowship any serious schism. I'm not saying somebody didn't get upset with somebody else or something like that, or a couple of people got upset with this person. But I'm talking about like church split type stuff. And it's because the Bible says love covers a multitude of sins, right? And it's to a man's honor to overlook an offense, you know? And we preach the grace and love and the mercy of God, and we, we talk a lot about following Jesus' example and loving one another. And we have uh, on our, the, the, the focal point of our fellowship is Jesus and, and his love for, for us, and that we're supposed to have 
His love by the Holy Spirit shed abroad our hearts toward one another. So often I'll, uh, how can I stimulate the brothers and sisters to love and good works? You know, what's right here in the word? So sticking with the word, you know, because that's what God does to us. He's telling us to consider how to do that, but that's what he does throughout his word. Amen. So I use the word a lot, but not just to love, but to good works. And there's, and so, I, so Lord, help me share in such a way where people understand that they, that they should be motivated to serve you. That they should be excited to serve you. That they should, their hearts should be glowing in love with you where they want to serve you. And that we should also recognize that we don't, we don't belong to ourselves, but we belong to you. And that we have the holy fear of God that motivates us to please the one who made us. And that we're not playing games and, and what have you. But I think it's imperative that we recognize that this is not written exclusively to pastors. This letter is written to Christians in general. The Hebrews, but from the Hebrews, he also is writing to us, not just the Hebrew believers, but to us. Just as the Old Testament, these things were written down for the sake of those who would live in New Testament times, amen? These passages in the New Testament were written down for us to learn from them because all scripture, the Bible says, is profitable, amen? It's given for correction and learning in righteousness that we can be fully equipped to do every good work for the Lord. So I want us to hone in on it. You know, let's read it one more time. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Let us consider. And it's interesting because that word literally means to direct one's whole mind to an object. It it, it means to direct one's whole mind to an object. And this is what God is calling you to do. He wants you to consider, to direct your whole mind on how you can what? Stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Did you know that? Now, let's see if you're obeying this verse or not. When you get up in the morning, are you giving attention to how you can encourage and stimulate others to love and good deeds? Is that your focus? It should be as a Christian. As a Christian, your focus should be not only how can I be a blessing to others, right? But how can I encourage others, stimulate others to be a blessing to others themselves? That's an important part of ministry. Now, by you simply loving people, by you simply being a blessing to others, you're already doing that in part. Did you know that? You're already encouraging them by God's goodness through you to them and by your example as to what it means to be a believer. So it doesn't mean you're not doing that, but he wants us to focus on this. I think it's so important that we get our our brains around this, especially, uh, you know, if you're in, and it's not, and I hesitate to go this way. Because as soon as I sp- start talking about specific ministries, some people will tune out and say, oh, yeah, it applies more to them. And then you're going to, that's why I qualified what I said earlier. It's for everybody. But it has its applications depending on where you minister in different ways. For instance, if you minister in children's church, I mean, you need to, you need to consider how you're going to creatively stimulate them to love and good works. It's very easy for children to tune out. So you have to be creative, don't you? Amen? But you don't want to go in there and just put on some circus act and be creative and they laugh and then you leave, but they haven't been stimulated to love and good works and all they remember is some of the goofy things you did. You need to leave them the better. You need to leave them uh, interested but motivated to love others and to be obedient to their parents and, and, and to seek to live righteously and godly in this present world. But So I'm encouraging you, those of you who had to teach uh, in children's church, praise God, what an opportunity. What a ministry. I've done that I, you know, before I was pastoring. I taught from college career to you know, adults and, and evangelism, all ages. But I also spent time with kids at a church I belonged to for some time, teaching the kids, recognizing how important it was that these, these little ones are going to grow up. And those are the formative years. And I knew the enemy was after them. I knew that, it, that there was a ton of resources and power and demonic activity bent toward destroying those kids. 
Whether it's through much of the stuff that's on the Cartoon Network teaching the occult or, or, or things like that that you do have to watch out for. Or a lot of the modern music which promotes sexual promiscuity and the destruction of marriage. Or a lot of the, a lot of the movies, I'm not saying all of them, but a lot of them, you know, promoting a lot of evil out there. There's so much pointed at them. How much more do we need to step up, amen, who are concerned about their souls, who aren't motivated by greed and money and fame and power and slime in the name of art? but are motivated to please God and to love the little ones. Jesus said, let the little ones come to me for as such are of the kingdom of God. And I'll tell you what, man, if you're, not, if you're saying, man, I, I need what kind of ministry? Well, guess what? I, the door's probably open. There's probably a door Betsy could fit you in, right? Or we could fit you in somewhere. Depending on, well, you know, we could fit you in, not just Betsy, but, you know, uh, you could talk to uh, the different brothers and sisters. You could talk to Steve. You could talk to myself. You could talk, uh, you know, to different people that are involved in various ministries if you want to get plugged in. We could always probably use more uh, workers in that arena. We haven't had to. Betsy's now shaking her head really frantically up and down. We could always use more. We, I'm not even, she didn't say, hey, Joe, can you talk to them? That's not it. You know, in fact, you know what? We rarely have to say from the pulpit that we need help because we do have a very loving, giving fellowship. And I'm not saying that because I was asked to. I wasn't. But I'm just thinking in terms of what an opportunity to minister What an opportunity to minister. Because you can have a huge impact in these children's lives. But those of you who are already doing it, are you just showing up? Oh, it's my day. Oh, that's right. I've got to teach tomorrow morning. Man, you should know ahead of time by a week, you know, or whatever. My time's coming up. What am I going to teach? I need to look for some illustrations through the week that might motivate them, that might stimulate them to love and good works. I need to see what, what, what might be the best way to communicate this truth I'm going to share with them to make them think. Something that will stay with them for the rest of their lives, maybe. And then you can have a huge impact on their lives. But if you just say, oh, I'll read a couple of scriptures and so forth, I'm not saying there won't be any fruit in that, but not as much as if you use scripture prayerfully as a wise master builder, as Paul called himself. Are we ministering to the children in children's church like that? Are we ministering to our own children if you're a parent? Like that. Do you consider them? And when I think of that word consider, I think of the scriptures like train up a child in the way that he should go. And in the way and then when he is old, he will not depart. You know how many people interpret that to mean train up a child in the way he should go, and then after he falls away, he'll come back? That's not what it says. It says train him up in the way he should go, and then when he's old, he won't depart. Meaning even when he's really old, he's still gonna hold on to the truth. Not saying there aren't exceptions. The Bible addresses exceptions at times. But the opportunity is there because you've done what God has said. And we need to train them up. And by the way, that word consider, you're giving your attention to how you can do this, right? Uh, that, that when you get into the Hebrew of train up a child in the way he should go, in the Hebrew, many, many uh, commentators have pointed out that the, the words mean, talk about training up in the way he should go mean the way that that child, because children are different, and you can direct them the same truth, the same word of God, and the same narrow path in different ways, just as you would bend a vine depending on how thick it was or, or, or the nature of, of that vine. It might be just really wild. So you have to treat one vine differently maybe than another vine, depending on the age of the vine, depending on, on you know, uh, its nature, now, we know children have the same fallen nature, and the Bible addresses that. We need to teach them. But you know what? I found out really fast that kids are different. I have a few of them, and they're all very different. And I have to apply different ways. I have to think about how to respond to Heather or talk to Heather versus how I talk to Holly at times, depending on where they're at, depending on what moves them, you know? I have to think about it, you know? Depending on, you know, maybe how they might respond. One might, I could just say, boom, straight, hey, you know, you need to take care of this, honey. The other one I might have to say, hey, come here, I want to talk to you real quick. You know, daddy loves you, you know, or something like that. You know, I mean, you, not like, it's not like that all the time. So you're like, oh, every time Joe talks to this daughter, he has to take her side and say, I love you. No, but I'm saying there's certain times and circumstances and children are different. My little boy responds very differently than the girls, you know. Anybody know that boys and girls are a bit different? I knew they were different. You know, I, I, there was a study that was recently done by a major university. They spent a ton of money on it, and they concluded that boys and girls are different. 
Wow, what a waste of money, man. You know? Look at what the Bible says, man. Look at just what you see before you. I mean, you got my little girl and she wants to, you know, they want to cuddle a doll. And my little boy, I mean, he can't even walk it. He's in his, you know, he's in his little deal cruising down the hall, you know, with his hand on his, on the wall, just, you know, blowing things up and everything. I'm like, man, I didn't see my girls do that. Oh, and you might, and you know, and you say, well, I got a little boy and he's hugging a doll and he loves his dollies. And well, then you help him because we're in, we've got to, we're in a fallen world, you know, and you train him the way he should go, but you got to use different tactics, you know? So we're in a fallen sinful world and people pick up a lot of influences from things around them. You got to be real careful. Now we need to be wise in these things and it takes time. You have to take time aside. You have to spend time with the Lord in prayer. You need to truly... I mean, it's interesting because that means you're studying people in a way, you know? Let's say you're ministering to people. You have a, a Bible study or people you encourage at work. You, don't, you can say something to this person maybe that you put a different weight to that person. Or The Bible says to study your wives if you're a husband. You know that? It says the husbands to dwell with your wives in an understanding way. As a weaker vessel, not weaker in the sense of not equal, but women are, are, are men are kind of clumsy, but they're typically pretty strong. And women are more sensitive and eloquent and fragile. I compare it to a, a big root beer mug like the guy and the woman is often, you know, she's more like a, a champagne glass or something. She's exquisite, but they break easier if you pound them on the wall. You don't pound a, you don't pound, I'm talking about the champagne glass. And you don't pound a woman, you know, you might rough house with a guy. But you don't go around slugging girls in the arm and get them in headlocks and throw them around, you know, typically, you know. You treat them with tenderness, right, and kindness. So it says, dwell with your wives in a what? Understanding way, right? With knowledge. That means you need to think about, okay, how do I, you know, it, it takes time. It takes time. I'm still learning. I'm 44 years old. I'm still learning, you know. But I've learned a lot. I learned that it's, it's a blessing for my wife to just, you know, when I see her go down the hall and she's gotten up, you know, to give her a hug if I'm passing her and tell her I love her and start the morning off that way or the day, depending on when she wakes up, because sometimes she gets to bed really late, you know. But, uh, but to, do, do, you know, love her, love, love her, you know, and do little things that would bless her. I mean, you know, when I first got married, I, I grew up and... The boys did the outside chores, you know, we cleaned up after the dogs and we pulled the weeds and mowed the lawns and stuff like that. And the gals, you know, they did the dishes and laundry and stuff like that. That's how I grew up. You know, it took me a while to learn that, wow, it really blesses her if, you know, we're done eating and I go and do the dishes while we keep talking. I, and I try to do that frequently now when we have a family dinner. And you know what? It blesses her heart so much. It's not a lot of work. It, you got to sacrifice a little bit. But wow, it's a blessing to her. So be a blessing. So, man, I wish I was a quick study on that in the first month, you know. Uh, I, well, you're saying, Joe, if you were, you know, quick study on it, you'd have her doing everything, including the lawn and the, everything else, you know. But, but no, she, she, she works hard, you know, and, and I do as well, but, and we try to share things, and uh, there's times where I got home really late, and she's had the trash out for me, because she thought, wow, he might not get home, he might come home, and and forget it, you know, or whatever, you know. So you help each other, you love each other, but you have to study your wife if you're a husband, amen? And you have to know how to encourage her to love and good works. You have to learn her, so to speak. I learned from the very get-go. I didn't know. I was newly married. I was young. And I didn't realize what happens certain times a month or how it can happen, you know, because I didn't know. I mean, my, my family, I grew up with a few sisters and a mom, you know, and... It wasn't once a month. It seemed like every day of the week because we were just all lost, right? So I didn't know. And then I found out when I was married, wow, I have to be astute. I have to watch the calendar. I have to, you know. And she's grown, you know, she's, she's been a real blessing. But when we were first married, we laugh about it. So it's, no, it's not like I'm sharing any dirty laundry here. We laugh about it because, uh, you, know, she, you know, she would, you know, just, you could say, hi, baby, how you doing? Why'd you say it like that? You know, and then, whoa, you know. And it's like, and to be fair, to be fair, because I didn't learn right away, I could snap back. Like, why did you do, why did you say it like that? Back? Why did you, I just said, how are you? You know? And before you know it, you're, you're fighting. You know? You've been there? Okay. You've been there? Joe, 
you have a time of the month, bro? Oh, man. You know, it's so funny because my cousin from Pennsylvania, he got, or he lives in Pennsylvania and uh, New York. Now he's on the New York side of the border. And he told me, he called me up one time, and he got saved like uh, 15 years ago. And wow, what a beautiful salvation experience he had. And uh, he's quite a bit older. He was one of the, you know, hippie era guy. And uh, a few years older than me. And he called me up, and he told me that. He told me that God allowed him to experience that thing, not physiologically, but where he just felt he went mental for a second and hormonally. And he said it gave me total understanding of where my wife comes from. It's like, wow. You know, I thought it was kind of a weird conversation, but I thought, I get it, bro. You know, I understand. And it's like, we don't know what each other go through a lot. We don't know the hormonal stresses as guys that women go through other than observing because we don't always go through it. The sisters, and so we don't understand the pressures that the sisters are under. So we need to appreciate the, the situation and step back and try to, to grow and so forth. And the sisters don't understand what we go through sometimes as men, you know, with different stresses that we carry and men tend to internalize things. And, and sometimes men don't give things to the Lord that they ought to and they carry too much and then they become stressed. And we need to try to understand one another and work with one another. But not only in, in a, a father-son or daughter relationship, mother-son or daughter relationship or husband-wife relationship, but as brothers and sisters in Christ... We're, we're seeing one another. We're encouraging one another. We're supposed to be stimulating one another to love and to good works. And it's imperative that we do this. In fact, notice what he says in verse 24. And let us, let us, you know, that's what Christianity is about. Us under Christ. Amen. It's about we were created for his glory. Amen. Everything is made by him and for him. Amen. And it's not about a solo relationship with just ourselves, Lone Ranger type deal. We're meant to be one with one another in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us. In fact, John Wesley, he said the most he said the most unchristian thing is a solo Christian or a solitary Christian, as he put it, which he's basically saying it's a misnomer, you know. It's just so unchristian for us not to be with other Christians, you see. Because we're the body of Christ. And the Bible says that we are members one of another. We, you know, hands, feet, eyes make up a body. We as believers make up different parts of the body of Christ. And we're supposed to, he's the head. And he's supposed to use us in the world to continue the ministry that he had begun here as his body and his representatives, his hands and his feet that are, are witnessing to the lost, that are, are being a blessing to those who are hurting, that are encouraging one another. And so we need each other, and it's so important. And it's interesting because in the next part of that verse, verse 24, let us consider how to stimulate. We consider, we have to think about, give our attention to how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. And I used to use the King James when I was a new Christian for a couple years. And, and uh, King James can be very, very archaic. And, instead of, and it's, it's a bummer when you have to explain what an English, old English word means in English, you know, for me personally. And the, the, the Bible is supposed to be translated. In the, it says the people heard Jesus gladly. And it says he, he spoke to them, you know, in their, their own language and, and uh, what have you. And so I, I believe a good English translation that's understandable is, is preferable. But sometimes I like the King James because sometimes it uses some interesting words. That, and that's why I use I've got a lot of scripture memorized in King James for when I was a new believer. And I like to use some of the King James words because sometimes they're, they come off stronger because they are a little bit rougher sometimes or, uh, and sometimes they denote a little more than some of our common words that don't sometimes communicate. But typically, you know, the more modern words communicate the Greek better to those who understand modern English as opposed to King James English. But I want to say this, is that word stimulate in the King James is, you know, let us, it talks about to provoke one another to love and good works. Let us provoke one another to good you know, love and good works. And, you know, I, I would think the word stimulate versus provoke would be a better word to use, and it probably is in some ways. But provoke, I thought, I always thought that was kind of interesting. Provoke, because it's almost like a provoke is almost like to challenge somebody, you know. But when I looked at the Greek word itself and its etymology and, uh, you know, uh, its history, that is, and and, and how it's a compound word. It's two different Greek words put together. And how it's translated so differently and the different me- uh, meanings and nuances in the Greek language of the first century. I thought, wow, provoke actually is an, uh, a pretty good translation. 
Let us provoke one another to love and good works. But it's not necessarily the best, because the word is pretty nuanced. And, but I think it's interesting, because we're, the name of this message, by the way, and I didn't have it for Darla when I first came in, because I just, I, man, there, I have, you know, there's different thoughts I had about this message. And I just settled with the, the name of this message is called the Ministry of Irritation. Okay? The Ministry of Irritation, because that word, uh, one of the meanings is to irritate. Not necessarily in a negative way, but in a positive way. You see, uh, a, uh, for instance, you know, an oyster gets irritated by a piece of sand, right? But through that irritation, it brings forth these, you know, incredibly beautiful pearls, you know? And we are not to irritate each other in a negative way. That means to be hurtful, but in an encouraging way. And it's interesting because it's a compound word uh, from para. P-R-A, which means besides, to be besides something. And auxuno, which literally means to sharpen. Per auxuno, which means to to sharpen beside, to come along somebody and sharpen them. Now, isn't that interesting? To sharpen means to, uh, in fact, that's pretty much, uh, and figuratively, I mean, figuratively it means to incite or to irritate. To incite or to irritate. Irritate. In fact, it's used kind of interestingly in Acts 15.39 where it says, And there arose such a sharp disagreement that they separated from one another, and Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. That's Barnabas and Paul got in a dispute. They got an argument, we're told, in the book of Acts. I love the Bible because it's just so honest. It gives us the warts that these guys go through. You see these so-called holy books that are, you know, written uh, that aren't inspired by God and they, they, make, they turn people into gods. Well, here we see the humanity of who we really are. And, and they had a sharp disagreement. It's translating that word. Sharp disagreement. Now, in that context, it wasn't a good thing in the, in the sense of, you know, they, they were having a fall, they were falling out with each other. But there was something going on there that's instructive to us that it is a word that deals with, you know, Kind of an, ag- an agitating someone in a positive way. Getting someone fired up. Provoking. See, provoke is usually used in a bad way, right? Let us provoke one another to love and good works. But if you could understand, and I thought, you know, there's different words we can, can look at to try to get an understanding of this in the English. But you know what? I almost like a stronger word that's negative, like the King James uses, uses provoke with a positive understanding. Because then you get the strength. Because it's supposed to, we're supposed to move people, but in a positive direction. And I'll give you a few of the translations. Uh, that, uh, and I don't recommend all these translations, but I wanted to look at a bunch of modern translations to uh, show you how they translated verse 24. Uh, the NAT says, And let us take thought, that's the word consider, take thought, of how to spur one another on to love and good works. What, what's a spur? Think of what, what does a spur do? And if you ride horses, you know, it kind of gouges a horse a little bit and it gets him going, you know. NIV, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. The New York Standard, which we're reading, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Uh, the New Living Translation, think of ways to encourage one another to outburst of love and good deeds. The BBE, let us be moving one another at all times to love and good works. The New King James, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. The New King James took away the word uh, provoke and just put consider because, I'm sorry, it has consider, but it says uh, stir up. Instead of provoke, it's stir up, you know. And all these words kind of do the job to a degree. Spurring, if you think of spur to spur literally, you know, it's to kind of cause a little bit of pain. Uh, figuratively, it means to just encourage, really, uh, stir up. I like the word, I like stir up. You stir something up, you get it cooking, you know, get it moving and what have you. All these things add to our understanding of that word a little bit or, or speak to different ways we can understand it. But it literally, it literally, it means to motivate somebody, you see, in an impactful way to, to walk in love and to walk in good works. And, and, and I thought, you know, we could spend a few minutes talking about that word, but I'd like to look at examples of that. I thought that would be very profitable because I was looking at uh, the different Greek, uh, you know, dictionaries and stuff as to what they say about that word. And I thought, you know, 
How does the author of Hebrews use that word? How does he do what he's telling us to do? That's what I thought. I mean, I went through this study a couple different times, and I thought, you know what would be good? is to look at how the author of Hebrews actually practices what he's preaching. How does he stir up those who are reading his book? And I found it very, very encouraging, very, very instructive. Uh, first of all, that word, as I mentioned, uh, para, besides, and auxuno, uh, to sharpen, means to come alongside one another and sharpen each other, you know, to love and good works, right? You can use the word sharpen. That, the word spur might be the best word, by the way, because a spur has something, what, kind of sharp on it and encourages, you know, to go forward. But it also could be understood in a negative way when that's not what he's talking about there. Although sometimes you have to say something negative to encourage people in the right direction as Christians. Isn't that true? To get a, a positive response. Now, it's interesting because the Bible says that as iron sharpens iron, so one man what? Sharpens another. The scriptures tell us as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. If you just have a piece of iron and you have nothing to sharpen it against, it's going to become dull. Well, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we are to sharpen each other. And sometimes when we sharpen each other, there may be sparks at times, you know. There may, uh, but if those sparks are used for the good and they bring forth the fire of the Lord where we do His will, it could be a good thing. So we can't sharpen one another if we're not with one another. That's why I think the very next verse is so fascinating as to follow verse 24. Not forsaking our own what? assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now notice this, that he's telling us to, uh, to sharpen one another, to do love and you know, walk in love and good works. But then in verse 25, he tells us how to do that. We need to be together so we can encourage one another. If you're, a, you know, if you've got a piece of iron, you have no other iron to sharpen it, you're in trouble. It's going to become dull. If you are a professing believer, but you're not fellowshipping and hanging out with other believers, you know, you're going to become dull. You're going to lose your edge in the Lord, you know. That's a serious thing. And so we need to be, one, be with one another if we're going to be able to fulfill this ministry. It's going to be really hard for me to stimulate you as my brothers and sisters to love and good works if I'm AWOL, if I never show up. You know, and I purposely make it my duty as a pastor to be here. You know, I don't I try not to miss a lot of Sundays or a lot of Thursdays. I don't miss very much. And and we could have I mean, there's we could pursue a lot more ministry that's outside. I know I'm saying that as I'm getting ready to go to Israel in a couple of weeks. But hey, uh, I don't but I invited you. It was up to you to come, <laughs> you see. <laughs> but uh you know, and, and as a pastoral ministry, you know, I get invited places and we could easily, I mean, before I was pastoring, do you know I did as many, pres- I did more presentations before I was pastoring than I do now, by far. But we haven't put a lot into, we can't always get back to people, we can't always, we don't push it, we don't, you know, get things going. And I believe the Lord has just allowed it and people understand that I'm a pastor and they, you know, so, but when we get invited, there's things we turn down and there's things we say yes to. But I want to be here for my brothers and sisters in Christ. I don't want to be one of those pastors that's gone all the time. Oh, yeah, it was Pastor Joe coming back, and you're all, you know, always asking that question. And, and there's instability, you know, and there's a, you know, this rotation of all these different faces all the time, and there's a, a lack of stability. I want, you know, I, so you need, I need to spend time with the brothers and sisters if I'm going to be of any lasting, fruitful effect in their lives and know my brothers and sisters says a shepherd should know his flock, you know. So I'm here. I try to be here. I don't dart out the door three minutes after service either, you know. Well, the same thing goes with you. You need to be around. You need to be committed to brothers and sisters in the fellowship. You need to spend time with them. Otherwise, you can't be fruitful. You need to do things together. That's awesome things, for instance, with a men's retreat, you know. With a men's retreat, it's so awesome because you know how many Sundays men would have to get together? I mentioned this at the men's retreat. Before they could have put in that kind of time that they're putting together with, with one another on, from a Thursday to Sunday or Friday to Sunday even, you know, over half a year of Sundays you'd have to get together. And you still wouldn't even spend as much time together because a lot of times you're studying the Word, you're praying, but you'll see each other here and there. I mean, you have to spend a year or more together on Sundays, just on Sundays. 
to be able to talk that much with your brothers and sisters, almost. So it's quite so. It's, so take advantage when you can of church camping trips, of of retreats, of baptisms, of things of that nature, of of just fellowship times. You know, because those are the times when you can encourage each other and you can help fulfill this ministry. But not just when the church has events, when the church has something going on, because the church is all of us. And Jesus said, "Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them." You see, and. Uh, you know, when we get together in his name, there's a manifestation of his power in our lives as we encourage one another as part of the body of Christ. And the scriptures say in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13, that we are supposed to encourage each other day after day. That means this is a ministry that this applies to every day. We're supposed to continually think about how we can stimulate one another Encourage one another to love and good works. And by the way, I love the focus there because notice the focus isn't on me. When I read that verse, it's not about Joe. It's about me being a blessing to others. Amen? It's not about get together to see what you can get out of. If you come to church and say, I'm just going to see how many people hug me, how many people say hi to me, and what I can get out of it, you know. No. You're not supposed to have that attitude. You're going to be depressed because people are far from perfect. People are going to fail you. Only Jesus could be perfect love to you. You have to come with an attitude of saying, instead of looking around wondering if anybody's going to say hi to me, I need to go around and say hi to everybody I can and be an encouragement to them. And who knows, maybe somebody brand new will walk in that hasn't even sensed the love of God before at all, and they're just going to wander in. And by encouraging them, it's going to impact them so radically. So, you know, and it stuck with me when Roger Fergang shared when he first stepped into church. He just stepped in as a Jewish man, non-believer in Christ, hardened, very, very sarcastic person. That's his testimony. You would never know Raj uh, before he was a believer versus now. You know, I mean, he plays and and he's fun and stuff, and he'll he'll joke and stuff. But he was brutal prior to being a believer. It's hard for me to believe because he's one of the nicest guys you'll meet, right? So, but I tell you what, he said when he walked in, he said somebody just a deacon. Or no, an usher he didn't have to be a deacon. Somebody just took him to a seat and sat down and said, and all and he said, Hey, God bless you. That's all he said. And Roger said he started to weep, he started crying like a baby, because he just sensed the love of God. And now, you know, I believe personally what was going on there is, you know, God used that guy's God bless you, but I believe the Holy Spirit was ministering to her, to him, speaking to him, and he was starting to see. Uh, you know, what, that there's supposed to be a connection between him and God and others that he didn't have and that he could have it on some level. And it so impacted him. And I thought, you know what? It talks about a timely word in the Proverbs, you know, and how words that are, are set right are like a, you know, a basket full of apples and fruit that's beautifully presented is that they could just, it could be so beautiful. Your life could have a beautiful impact on others just by encouraging them in the smallest ways. I mean, a few words have, you know, words. Look what Hitler did with his words in the opposite direction. You can use the word of God and encourage people in the love of God and have a huge effect for the good. Now, I think it's important that we recognize, I've given you a few translations of that, but we are supposed to be salt and light, amen? We're supposed to be salt and light. And salt does a few different things. Jesus said you're the salt of the earth, and salt... In those days, preserved, right? We won't go into studying salt. Totally just mentioned something real quick to you. It was used to preserve your meat. I mean, they didn't have refrigeration. So you would salt your meat. And a lot of people, they got wages in salt. Salt was very important, you see. When someone says that old expression, that person's not worth their salt. Salt was very, very important because it would preserve. As Christians, we're the salt of the earth. You know, if we weren't here, it would be all over. Because, I mean, if, if, if the witness of everybody has taken place and everybody had been witness to, I should say, and then God took us, it'd be all over. Because the only reason God isn't wiping us out is because there's more people to get saved. And because just like Sodom, when, when, when Sodom was existing, and God said, I'm going to wipe it out. I'm going to destroy it with fire because of their perverse sin and how wicked they become. And remember what uh, Lot said? If there's so many righteous people, will you relent and not in... Yeah. And, but there wasn't, well, if there's this many righteous and he kept going down, yes, I won't. But there weren't. And the righteous that were there, God was taking out and God took them out, you know. 
you know, somebody said to me the other day, why doesn't God just, you know, wipe out San Francisco, you know? And I was like, whoa, man, you know? And I was like, you know what? You know, God, you know, he, his, the Bible says very clearly that he took Lot out of Sodom, you know, before he wiped it out. I'm not saying God, I mean, God does, look at history, look at what the Bible says. All I have to do is read your Bible. God does devastate whole nations, okay, when they become very wicked. We went through that last week when we looked at the scripture and what it has to say with the Canaanites. You know, he gave them time. And there are some believers, believe it or not, in Frisco, people that love Jesus, people that are there witnessing, okay? But right now, just like when you look at the book of Revelation, you don't see God from the very, the very beginning of the tribulation just <laughs> wipe out the whole earth. He brings judgments, selective warnings to get their attention. And then they increase, and they increase, and they increase uh, until they become absolutely devastating and, and the people that won't repent end up getting just totally wiped out, you know? And it's interesting to me because we need to understand that we have a lot of work to do here. We're left here for a reason. Not to say, well, I'm going to sit back and just watch everybody become wicked and watch God destroy everything. No, we need to go and warn people and say, hey, you know what? God's a serious God. He loves you, but he's also serious. You need to repent because he's also holy. You need to turn to him because he judges sin. But you know what? He had his son die in your place so you could be saved. And we need to share the good news with them that Jesus died for them and, and rose again. And we need to be that salt. And, but right now, we are preserved. If we weren't here, if there weren't going to be any believers... You know, like, say Lot wasn't in Sodom, do you think God would just, you know, no, it would have been destroyed even sooner. So we, you are the salt of the earth in the sense that you help preserve. You pull all the Christians out of our country. I'm not talking about the hypocrites and the, those who just go to church but have nothing to do with God. I'm talking about bona fide, spirit-filled, Jesus-loving believers that seek to be a blessing to others and seek to be righteous and be an encouragement to others. And you take them all out of our country, take them all out of every PTA and take them out of every facet of society, What do you have left in our country, guys? Just perversity, for the most part, you know? And rebellion. And no real standards being lifted up. And I'm saying, for the most part, maybe there's some vestiges of moral views within people that aren't Christians. So you'd have some people that would be outraged, but there would be nobody holding up the Word of God, saying this is the standard. I mean, do you think TV would be the same? But because Christians... (laughs) Won't watch certain things and, and complain, and there's a lot of believers here. It's not quite as bad as it, it would be, believe me. And it's getting worse all the time. I mean, they're, they're, I mean, we've been marginalized, so they're ignoring us more and more. But we're salt. But another thing salt does, biblically, Paul said, let your words be seasoned with salt. So when we stimulate others to love and good works, we should look at our, we should season or flavor our words. What does salt do for f- food? If you can you eat salt? I mean, if you don't have high blood pressure, you can eat salt. And what does it do? It flavors it, it makes it in- more interesting. I mean, I, you know, if I have a burger, you know, I just fried up a hamburger the other day. If I get burger, up, it's good. But I put a little bit of salt on it. Oh man, it doesn't have salt. It's just not as good. And I want it more. And as believers, we're supposed to flavor our words in such a way to where. They're interesting and tasteful. When you're talking to the children, you can think about, how can I best explain this? To stimulate them. To want more. To love and good works. And by the way, the Word of God, I find very, very, very flavorful. You know? The truth is flavorful if you love truth. I'm not talking about changing the Word of God or anything like that, because then you're not putting salt, because God's Word is like salt. Then you're dumbing it down. So, but another thing salt does is salt irritates, doesn't it? You ever get salt in a wound? Oh, it hurts. And it motivates you to do something about it, right? And sometimes when we we encourage one another, we can even be a little salty, you know? I'm not talking about fleshly. Do not, do not make the mistake of thinking that, wow, Joe said it's okay that I'm an irritable person and always get on people's nerves. No, that's not what I'm talking about. That's the flesh, I'm talking about in a godly, encouraging way where you are loving them, not thinking of yourself, and you're thinking of how you can be an encouragement to others by blessing them with your words. And sometimes that does mean by giving a hard saying. Do you know that? Sometimes you might be irritable because they don't like what you say, because you love them enough to say, hey, you know what? I love you, but I got to tell you this, man. You know? 
I'm going to take this wrong, but I just don't think you should slap your wife anymore. You know, I saw you in the car, you know, or whatever. It's hard to correct people, isn't it? That would be easier to correct them on, you know. But if, let's say, you know, uh, but, you know, there's, we've got to correct people sometimes, right? So, I mean, sometimes it will be irritable to the person even though it's true. But you can do that, you can do that in love or you can do that in anger. You can go up to the person and say, and God forbid, man, if you slap your wife, you're in huge trouble with God, you know. Uh, and you can motivate people that way. I just motivate you. I'm always trying to think in those ways. Okay, I don't want to give people like, But you know what? You don't, but you don't go up to someone, let's say, you know, they did something wrong and, you know, they made a a mistake. You could be more sinful than their sin by the way you correct them. Somebody could do something that's wrong. You know, that whole, you know, adage about spilled milk, right? When someone spills milk, it's typically going to be an accident. And somebody could get up and start screaming and yelling and everything else. And guess what? Who's more at fault now? The person who accidentally spilled their milk or the person who is acting like a madman? You know? And we've got to make sure that we're walking in love and that we're encouraging each other. So, I'll tell you what. How did the author of Hebrews, you know, do the... Well, go to Hebrews 13. Because look at what he says in verse 22 when he closes this one of the longest letters in the Bible, in the New Testament. He says, But I urge you, brethren, bear with this word of exhortation, for I have written to you what? Briefly, man, that's after 13 chapters. Can you imagine his long letters, this guy? You know, this guy's pretty heavy, you know. I've written to you briefly, but notice what he says. He calls it a word of exhortation. To exhort means to encourage somebody uh, in the view of righteousness, you see. And he, he has already stimulated them to love and good works. You don't realize how many people were touched by this letter. We're being touched with it, you know. 2,000 years later almost, here we are, you know, for, for the last several months, we've been encouraged by this brother in the Lord as he allowed God to use him. Well, what was he doing? He was stimulating them to love and good works. In fact, look at chapter 13, verse 1. What does he say? Let love of the brethren continue. So he was encouraging them to continue to love each other and not to neglect hospitality, right? You know, there's the good works. In fact, look at verse 14. For here we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. And, and you're going to see why I brought you there. It seems like it doesn't make sense why I brought that verse up. But I brought you there for a reason, because I'm going to close with that concept. But I want you to remember how he ends his book with certain things in this particular chapter. Look at verse 20 now. Now the God of peace who brought up uh, from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant even Jesus our Lord equip you in every good thing to do the do his will working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be the glory forever and ever amen so he's chapter 13 verse 1 he's encouraging them to grow in love or to continue in love right He's talking about hospitality, uh, visiting prisoners, you know, remembering the poor and uh, marriage bed being sanctified, things like that. And, and, and here now he's encouraged them 20 and 21, it, being equipping them for good works. He's, he's stimulating them what? To love and the good works. He delineates different good works that they can do, like prison ministry, for instance, or, you know, uh, you know, the, the, you know sanctification in, in, their, in their sex lives and, and entertaining strangers, you know, being, showing hospitality and all these different wonderful things. And then in verse 22, he says, again, I, I mean, I mentioned that verse, but he mentions it as being a word of exhortation. So a lot of the ways we encourage people, we stimulate people with, uh, to love and good deeds is with words of exhortation. Using words, you see, we encourage people with our words. You know, you know we talk about being slow to sp- uh, you know, speak, but quick to hear. You know, God gave us one mouth and two ears, right? But he did give you a mouth, and he wants you, if you're able, if you can open your mouth, to pray to be used by him to encourage other people in the faith. And it's not something you have to get all freaked out on. You say, oh, I just, it's hard for me. No, you know what? Just fall deeper and deeper in love with the Lord. Pray to be used by God, and guess what? It will just happen. You just get close to God, and it just happens. You know, when a, when a gal starts seeing a guy, and you know she's young, and she just falls in love with this guy, she just wants to talk about him with everybody else, you know? She wants to spend hours talking to the guy, and then she wants to, then she just starts talking about this guy to others because she's excited. Well, you know what? You just get close to Jesus, right? And spend more and more time with him in his word and prayer, and you'll just want to talk about him. And when people speak against him, you'll want to speak up for him, you see? 
And it'll be naturally supernatural, so to speak. Supernaturally natural. If you know what I mean. I'm talking about it'll just work out by God's power in your life. But at the same time as you're doing that, also be prayerful. Lord, use me. Help me to consider how I can be more of a blessing. Give it some thought and just get closer and closer uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it's interesting because how is he stimulating them? He's encouraging them with just straightforward language as how to walk. That's one thing we could do. We could just encourage people. Somebody says they don't, they're not involved in ministry. Well, hey, have you considered this? Did you know, uh, you know that certain brothers and sisters you know, are involved in prison ministry here? You, know, you, uh, you, know, uh, you can maybe talk to uh, uh, you know, Dean and Susie about getting involved in prison ministry. Or, or you, know, you can uh, talk to you know, David David or his lovely wife. And you guys, put your hands up, you know. Put your hands up if you don't mind. Okay, there they are. Say, yeah, I heard you mention their names, yeah. I told, yeah, I said, remember I said you get involved in prison ministry? Yeah, but I heard you mention names, but I, didn't, I don't know who they were. Now you do, okay? I'm just saying, uh, Marcy, David, David, and, and they would talk to you. We've got other people involved in prison ministry here. There's a lot of need out there, guys. There's a lot of people hurting. There's a lot of, opp- we're going to miss our opportunities. Oh, but I'm in a comfort zone. Don't you see, Joe? I work, and then I, you know, I have to put the kids to bed, and da, 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 da. Well, you know what? Are you doing things for the Lord? If you're not, look for something to get involved in. How you could better... I mean, there's 50 million babies. I used to say 40 going on 50 million. Now you know it's 50 million now. I no longer say 40 going on 50 million babies killed in our nation. I mean, there's a holocaust going on. You could be involved in letting, making people aware of what's going on. Oh, it's going to get worse, so hey, why do anything? Is that what you say? Well, guess what, man? There was, slavery was here for some time in our country. It's gone away, Right? Oh, I know things are going to get worse worldwide, but every once in a while there's changes in nations for the better, right? And even if your voice doesn't you know, end up contributing to the overthrow of Roe versus Wade and it doesn't get overthrown until the Lord returns, you could still speak up for babies and save some lives, you know? Even more important than, you know, a lot of the things we talk about is the eternal salvation of souls. That's something that everybody should be engaged in, Amen. Everybody should be engaged in that. So there's a lot of things we need to do. I notice also what he does in Hebrews. Let's back up again. Look at verse 24 again. Hebrews 10, 24. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. You know one of the wonderful ways that he stimulates his readers to love and good deeds? He lets them know about the grace of God. What Jesus Christ has done for them. Look at verse 19. 19 through 23. We will not read all of it because we've gone through it verse by verse already. But therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. And he goes on to talk about how Jesus is our great high priest and we are his house. Then he tells them to draw near. What is he telling them? That we have this incredible access to God in heaven, right? Right? That we can now go into the throne room because our awesome Savior, our high priest, gave his life for us so we'd have a relationship with God. Therefore, he's, he tells them to draw near to God. So he doesn't just say, hey, pray. He doesn't just say, pray more. He says, you know what? You have the privilege to pray more. And we should be doomed because of our sin. But look what God did for you to give you access. Therefore, you should take advantage of that access that he's given you. And you should draw near to him. And so he's letting them know that there's not just a principles here, but there's all kinds of work that it took to open the door for us to heaven, that God's done. And he shares the grace of God. And Titus says, the grace of God, it says, that is revealed from heaven, right? It says that, uh, you know, that brings salvation, it says, teaches us to live godly lives and soberly in this world, right? As we await our, our blessed God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So God's grace teaches us to live godly and soberly in this world. It motivates us to live righteously. The Bible says, Paul says, it's his kindness that leads us to what? Repentance. So he shares much of God's kindness through here to motivate them to clear up, first of all, so they understand what they have, who they are as children of God, that they're privileged to enter into the throne room freely. And that encourages them, that stimulates them. To love, to love God, to love others, to good deeds. Like, wow, I couldn't, I was doomed. I couldn't even, I couldn't work my way to heaven. I deserve hell. But God saved me, man. Now I want to lead other people to the Lord. Now I want to serve the one that saved me, that gave his life for me. Amen? You get motivated. So he motivates them. He stimulates them. 
to love and good works by, by speaking incessantly about the finished work of Christ on the cross, about the kindness of our great God and Savior. And that's one way that you stimulate each other is you exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? You speak of what Jesus has done for you. You testify about how wonderful he is. That's an encouragement to others. You know? If you're constantly talking about yourself instead of Jesus and walking around like you've just eaten a lemon, woe is me all the time, well, your focus is in the wrong place. We all go through times. I'm not saying if you're in a funk right now, how dare you be in a funk. But if you're in a funk all the time because your eyes are on yourself, that's sin. Get your eyes off of yourself and get them on Jesus. And think and consider how you can encourage other people to love and good works. First of all, make sure you're right with God. But as soon as, as, soon as you know you're right with God because you've repented of your sin and you're seeking Him, then what's left but to rejoice in your salvation and to give Him the glory He deserves and to seek to bring other people into the throne room through the blood of Jesus by sharing the gospel. I'll tell you what, man. There are so many professing Christians out there that live depressed lives because they've got their eyes on themselves and they're not living for Jesus. And what's funny is they've been deceived by the world to think that if they, can, if they focus on themselves and do for themselves that they're going to be happy when they've got it all backwards. The world has it backwards. You see, it's all the opposite in the kingdom of God. The first shall be last. The last shall be first. Here we think, the more I can get, the happier I'm going to be. No, Jesus said it's better to give than it is to receive. John says, I have no greater joy than this to see my children walking in the truth. That's where the joy is. Because the true joy comes from the Holy Spirit, comes from the Lord. It's the joy of the Lord. And as we walk in the Spirit and we encourage one another in the Spirit, we experience the joy of God. If we become narcissistic and self-focused, you know, we close our hearts to God and we don't experience His joy. And you can stare at your navel all you want and meditate on yourself, but you're just, you're going to be bummed out. Because guess what? You all by yourself are really not all that exciting. I'm just being honest. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. You're made in the image of God. You know, more valuable than many sparrows. He cares wonderfully about you. But if you separate yourself and you focus on yourself and it becomes about you, guess what? That's not something beautiful. That's something ugly. And no wonder you're depressed. Because your joy isn't supposed to be derived from you. It's supposed to be derived from God. The fruit of the Spirit is love, peace, joy, long-suffering, gentleness, and so forth. So we need to focus on the Lord. And the church is getting all backwards. Church is trying to talk about self, 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 love, self, love, self. It's like, wait a minute. That's the world. The Bible warns that last days they would be lovers of self. That's where it says the world would go. Jesus said we must deny ourselves, right? And follow him, you see. And and live for Jesus. And I'll tell you what. If you get your eyes on Jesus and you say, Lord, it's about you. I can't believe you saved me. Happy is the one, it says, whose sins are not imputed or credited to him. You have joy because your eyes will say, wow, this is what I deserve. If you recognize who you really are, a sinner that had been in rebellion to God, who's been, who's been saved now by the grace of God, how could you not be joyful that you're not going to hell and that God loves you? Unless you're getting your focus off of that truth and you're getting focused on something mundane compared to that truth. But every other truth should be looked at in light of what God's word says. Amen? And then as you look at other things and the responsibilities, in the light of the fact that you've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus, you will be able to carry it out with joy, with happiness and and fulfillment. But I'm telling you guys, this is verse 24 is not what we see today in so much of Christianity. We're not stimulating one another to love and good works. We're focusing on ourselves and what we can get out of something. Do you come to church and say, how can I be an encouragement to others? How can I consider How can I stimulate? How can I just be a blessing to someone? Even if it's just, you know, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to put a burden on your back where it's like, man, I got to go to church and say hi to everybody, spend 10 minutes with everybody, or I'm going to, no, just pray, God, use me, and just be a blessing to others. It'll It'll just happen in Christ as you seek him and you consider how you can be used by God. And the Holy Spirit will lead you as you seek the Father, you see? And you know what? The church is in need of the love of God. Non-believers need to walk in here and walk into a wall of God's arms that want to embrace them and love them. And I don't care if they got spiked hair that's three feet high and it's green and hasn't been washed for two years. You need to love people. 
You know, Jesus ministered among the prostitutes and among the drunkards and among the tax gatherers that, that the religious people rejected. We need to reach out to the lost. We need to love the hurting. We need to remember, as it says in Titus chapter 3, that we were once there. He says that. Paul says, remember that we came from there, that setting. We once were walked in lust, Paul says. We might once walked in hatred and aligned one another. But when the grace of God or the love of God for all mankind came, and he mentions the grace of God, you know, we've been changed. Don't forget where you came from. Now we need to reach out to them just as God reached out to us. So we need to stimulate one another to love and good works. We need to also be a witness to the non-believer. Now the Lord uses the grace of God. I mean, this author speaks of the grace of God a lot to motivate, encourage them to know Jesus better and to live for him. That doesn't mean, and you know what else he uses a lot? What else does he use besides the grace of God? He uses the fear of God a lot, this guy, the author of Hebrews. I mean, over and over again, there's these strong warnings about apostasy. In fact, look, if you will, at verse 26. Look what he says. After he warns them not to forsake assembling themselves together, he says, For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severe, verse 29, punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. Verse 31, It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. These are strong warnings. Some of the strongest warnings you find in all of the Bible are right here in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 6, 4 through 8. Hebrews 10, 26 through 31. Hebrews chapter 12, verses like 22 through like 26. Hebrews chapter 3, verses verse 6, verses 12 through 14. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9. I mean, they're all over the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. Throughout Hebrews, you get warning after warning after warning. Because guess what? We need to recognize that there are consequences to rebellion. There are consequences to rebellion. Isn't that true? And as he's giving truth. He's just speaking truth. And God's kindness leads us to repentance. So that will encourage people. If they're, if they're sinning and they're hurting, you can encourage them to just experience the love of God, to walk in the love of God, to, to serve God. Because once we experience the grace of God, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, by grace we're saved through faith, that not of ourselves, the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So we're saved by God's grace. You can't earn it. It's a gift. But the very next verse, verse 10, that he says we we're created in Christ Jesus, right? Before the foundation of the world, for a life of good works. We're motivated. Now that, that's why he saved us, man. So we can know him and do what we we're called to do, be his servants. But that motivates us. But guess what? The fear of God is a motivating factor as well, isn't it? Sure is, because the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Wisdom. What's wisdom? Wisdom is walking in love. Wisdom is uh, applying God's truth to our lives, good works. So when the fear of God is taught, you are also stimulated to love and good works. Amen? It says when it talks about husbands loving your wife as Christ loved the church, you know what it says? He says to submit one to one another in the fear of Christ. That's how he starts that whole passage on how husbands and wives are supposed to treat one another. Do you know that? And you know what? A lot of people, they'll start right there in that passage. But I like to bounce up the verse right before that. Because right before he goes into husbands and wives, how they're supposed to treat each other, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 through 32 there. But if you start at 20 and 21, you'll see it says, submit to one another in the fear of Christ. And that lets me know that, you know, the love of God and what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross is, and as an illustration as to what I'm supposed to do for my wife and lay my life down, that motivates me. But you know what? The fear of Christ motivates me too. You know, it, it, motiva- it encourages me like, you know what? I tell people when I do marriage counseling, I go, you know what? What would you do, you know, if you were being watched the entire time by your in-laws, you know? You know, if, you know, if your mother-in-law was in the closet listening to how you teach your wife, well, you don't say that. He might say, I'd bar it shut forever. I don't know why you do, you know, but I know what I would do. I would make sure, you know, especially you're newly married. I say this to newly married people right before they get married. I go, you would be on your best behavior if you're smart. I go, but you have something way beyond that. You have the living God, Jesus Christ, living in your house right now. And you're going to answer to him more than any mother-in-law. And you need to fear him and treat your wife in a loving way. 
care for her. Same with the wife to the husband. So it mo- motivates us. The fear of God motivates us. And it says the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. In fact, in Hebrews 12, turn really quickly to Hebrews 12, verse uh, 28. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an, an acceptable service with reverence and what? Awe. That's right, with reverence and awe, with the fear of God and awe. Verse 29, for God is what? Our God is a consuming fire. Now notice the context in which he says to uh, offer him with gratitude, you know, acceptable service. He's talking about your good works. How do we do that? With reverence and awe. You see, you, you're, we're motivated to give him acceptable good works, motivated from the heart to do what pleases him because he is a God who is to be feared. He is a holy God. He is a consuming fire. And that's why I think uh, people do a great disservice when they ignore certain verses in the Bible because they think they know how to communicate God's truth and what to communicate better than God does. That's why I went through the passage I went through last Sunday. I think that message was called the most difficult passage in the Bible or something like that. I call it that because you don't ignore those passages. Those passages give you incredible insight into who God is so you can relate to Him properly. So we need the love of God. We need to understand the grace of God, the kindness of God that leads us to repentance, that motivates us to love and good works. But we also need to fear God, for it's the beginning of wisdom. And it helps us render acceptable service, works that are related to Him as for who He really is. You see, many of these preachers on television, they make God this divine bellhop that you command with the right combination of words and the right amount of faith to get him to do like some force his thing for you and their fear of god goes out the window it becomes like witchcraft god's a force that you manipulate with with words no god is the one you submit to and you seek his will and faith means to lean upon him and and trust him to take care of you but trust him to take care of you in the way that he sees fit amen and so how do we motivate one another to love and good works through the love of god through the fear of God. That means we encourage people with the, with the promises of God, but also the warnings of God. And it depends. If I'm talking to someone and they are hurt and they feel like, wow, Joe, you read Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 through 31, and it says if I, you sin willfully, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, and I, and I just feel like I've done so much wrong and that I, there's no more sacrifice for sins for me. And then I'll go to that person and I'll say, hey, look at the context here. The context is going back to the Mosaic law to be right with God. And no longer wanting the blood of Jesus and just living your life in, under the Mosaic law. And that's, that's not about somebody who says, Lord, have mercy on me, that's truly seeking God. And then I tell them, Scripture's like, you know, if their heart's seeking to be right with God, that he won't bruise or he won't break a, broke, a, a bruised reed. He says he will not quench a, 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 a flickering flame, but he'll fan it. And that he who began a good work in you has promised to complete it the day of Jesus Christ. And, and that neither height nor depth nor principality or power or any other created thing could separate us from the love of God, which is Christ Jesus. And, and no man could snatch you out of his hand, and he's greater than all. And I give him all these beautiful verses. However, guess what? If I run into a professing brother, and he's getting drunk, and he's partying, and he's mistreating his wife and he's doing these different things and he comes you know by and i see him at the store and he's reeking with alcohol and he's hey joe praise the lord i don't give him those scriptures i tell him hey man do you realize it says in luke chapter 12 jesus said if he comes back and his servant is getting drunk with the drunkards and beating the maidservants that he'll come back at a time they're not aware of and he'll cut them in pieces and and throw them with the unbelievers and that drunkards will not inherit the kingdom of god and you know what i'm saying I'm stimulating both of these people to love and good works in different ways because this one needs encouragement because their heart's broken and they want to be right with God. And, and Jesus said he wouldn't cast them away and I'll give them those verses. Jesus said whoever comes to me I won't cast away. as truth. But the person who thinks, hey, I could just rebel against God, everything's cool, then I'll give them the warnings. Depends on where people are at. What you use. That's why you need to be in prayer and say, God, use me all the time. Pray, God, use me by your Holy Spirit. Because if you're not praying, you're just thinking, but you're not praying, I believe considering means to prayerfully think about, prayerfully as you're talking to God, how you can be used by God. There's all kinds. I mean, Hebrews 12, he says that if you're a child of God, you'll be chastened. You'll be chastened. You'll be disciplined. So another way he encourages them is by talking about God's chastening. 
and how God disciplines us. God does discipline us, doesn't he? To get our attention. Now, you need to judge yourself and make sure you walk the straight and narrow so you don't have to be disciplined. Children that are obedient, my children, the more obedient you are, man, there's no, not a problem. Same thing with God. We walk with him. We don't need to be chasing as much. Jesus said, as many as I love, I rebuke and I what? I chasten. And, and he does. And he says, if you're not chastened, it's because you don't belong to him. Well, that, does, that means that God doesn't love the lost people in the world. No, he loves them. He doesn't chasten them as children, though. He brings warnings of judgment that they will perish if they don't turn to him. In fact, the scriptures say in Proverbs 36, 6, the righteousness, your righteousness is like the mountains, O God. Your judgments are like a great deep, O Lord. You preserve man and beast. Proverbs 9, 9 says, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true, and they are righteous all together. Proverbs 26, 9 says, for when your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world learn righteousness. Catch that? Check out that verse, man. For when your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world learn righteousness. The problem is, people don't believe God exists. So when his judgments come, they don't even see it. Oh no, God doesn't judge. God's not like that. For when your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world learn righteousness. You know, it used to be the past where people understood that God judged things. and they understood, they, Now today, people have become so agnostic in their understanding where they look at God as he's far away. He's never involved in working in humanity. But do you know there's a scripture that says when there's, God, the Lord says when he is, when there's a calamity, he says, I have done it. Do you know that? I'm not making that up. Don't say, Joe said that when there's a calamity, God said he's done it. No, that's what the Bible says. Now, it doesn't mean that he has done it in the way you might think he had done it. He means he allows it at least, but somehow he uses the glory. There's nothing that happens that doesn't happen because God allows it to happen. At least that's his permissive will. There's certain things that he specifically goes, this is going to happen. Boom. There are things where he says, I'm not going to let this happen. He stops it. There are things where he says, I'm going to let this happen as a natural consequence to their rebellion. Boom. There's all kinds of different ways. It's very, very complicated. We can't know perfectly every incident of what is the will of God or not. If you show me statistics which show in San Francisco that 25% of the men there have admitted that they've been having sex or have had sex with, with kids 16 years and younger. That's horrific. Do you realize how many homosexuals are there? And that's 25%. Exane, and those are the ones who admit it. And then when I see a statistic in the latest uh, report from Frisco and that there's this MRSA outbreak that's huge among the genitals, and I see what God's Word says about how when you break his sexual boundary, uh, boundaries, there will be physical consequences in your body. And when I see the morbidity report that was just put out by the CDC, AIDS is stable or down. Doesn't mean stable doesn't mean good. It's still horrific among intravenous drug users, among heterosexuals. It's still terrible. But it's up 11.4% in the, this year. 11.4% among those who have engaged in homosexual activity between the ages of 13 and 24. I don't think all these 13 and 14 year olds just, are just getting together, guys. A lot of these kids are being molested. So God is going to judge. He says, don't be deceived. Now, does that mean everybody that has AIDS, herpes, gonorrhea, syphilis, or what have you, is a judgment from God? Not necessarily. And you can't, you can't be positive on that, you know? So you need, to, you need to say, okay, you know what? There's a pattern here that God does judge things, but... Why does he judge? Why does he? Because he loves us. And it says, for your judgments are in the earth. The inhabitants of the world will learn what? Righteousness. Do you know if nobody ever saw any consequences of sin? How many Christians do you think there would be? Zero. You know, because they, the fear of the Lord leads to wisdom. And if they didn't feel there was consequences of sin, they wouldn't feel like Jesus needed to die. They wouldn't even have a motivation to come to Christ. But I do believe that God's judgment is in the earth. I mean, right now, I mean, there's like literally, I mean, they're still working on all these fires. And if you look at a, a, a uh, we've got it on our, in our, in our uh, article on Good Fight. If you look at a satellite view, it's just all around Frisco and everything. But I said, that doesn't mean every house that burns down, oh, that was God's judgment. And you know what? I don't even know for 100% that that's specifically God said, this is how I'm going to do it. I don't know. I just know there's a pattern that there's consequences 
And I'll just say this, and Su- Susie and Dee and my wife and my kids are my witnesses. I said to them, I said, you know what? I fear for our state that something unprecedented, something's going to happen that we're not expecting right after they start doing the gay marriage thing. And I know what happens to Sodom and Gomorrah. And I also know that God doesn't wipe people out altogether. He gives them warning judgments, like in the Revelation they build up. And then that went down. Does that mean that, well, since you felt that, that wasn't, something like that wasn't happening, and you have some presence, so that means it's, it's for sure 100% that's what God was doing? No, it doesn't. I don't know. I don't know. God could be saying, Joe, you know what? That is all just a freak thing, that there were five to 6,000 lightning bolts without any rain that just hit in California like never before. And there was no rain to put them out right after this.